we look at a couple of different metrics and the cap rate is really second or third. We're looking at the internal rate of return. We're looking at the cash on cash returns. We look at uh, return on cost. We look at the three-year average, the seven-year average. Uh, we look at an unleveraged return, a leveraged return. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income, and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexammer, and with me is Stash Gelasinski. Stash, I butchered your name again, I'm sure, but uh, how do you say your Perfect. last name? <laughs> Gelasinski. All right, awesome. Uh, so Stash, you are with Capstone Partners, uh, have been there for, for several years. How many years uh, exactly have you been with Capstone? Uh, so we've been with my, my team and I have been with Capstone Apartment Partners. It'll be two years this coming August, though we've okay. been working with them for a little bit longer than that. Great. Um, and you've, you've been in the commercial brokerage. You specialize in, in multifamily in Cincinnati is your home base. I know you guys do business in Columbus and Dayton and uh, some in Lexington and, and probably a few other markets. Uh, tertiary markets around. Um, I wanted to bring you on uh, to talk about quite a few things, uh, to talk a little bit about your business and, and the successes you've had, uh, as well as talk about what you're seeing in the market. And then lastly, on, you know, a lot of people have questions on how to work with brokers and how to work with brokers that are, are doing business. And it's easy to, to hook up with a, a residential real estate agent um, and get them to commit to you, but it's a lot harder to hook up with a commercial broker and get them to uh, commit with you and, and take you serious. So I wanted to talk about that as well. So first off, I'd like to welcome okay. you and appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Well, why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit more kind of about you, about your background and, and about what you and your team are doing right now? Sure. So um, I guess we'll start with the firm. Uh, the firm is Capstone Apartment Partners. Uh, we have offices in Tampa, Orlando, Nashville, Charlotte, and Cincinnati. Charlotte's our headquarters, and that's where the firm was started uh, about 10 years ago uh, and has grown to, I think we have maybe 25 or 30 brokers. Um, and we function in the private capital um, structured private equity, uh, semi-institutional space. So, you know, the deals that we're looking at are, you know, 50 to 100 units up to several hundred units, if not a thousand units in, in a chunk, be that in a single asset or uh, across a portfolio. 
Um, myself, I've been here in the Cincinnati market for uh, about eight years. Um, I came here for a deal that I was working on and um, just, I, it's a great city. Um, I like it a lot. And it's, it's treated me well and uh, I built a, a brokerage practice in tandem with uh, my, my partners here, uh, Nathan Murphy and Sharif Gouda. The three of us function as a team uh, and together our office covers um, Ohio and Indiana and then we kind of split up Kentucky between us and our Nashville office. Um, and then our focus is specifically our office is mostly geared towards Cincinnati, Dayton, and Columbus. So we do have um, traction in Northeast Ohio and in Indiana as well. Um, and the deals that we're looking at are, you know, traditionally we're not prospecting on anything less than, you know, 100 units. Sometimes we'll dip down in, into the 50s. Um, and, you know, we're, actively prospecting on the market. We're out there all the time. If I'm not on the phone with you, uh, I'm on the phone with somebody else. Um, you know, my job as a broker is to be on the phone. If I'm not on the phone, I'm not doing my job. So that's kind of the gist of it. Cool. Cool. Well, let's talk uh, quickly uh, about, you know, how do you, how do you find, you know, you don't have to go into extreme detail, but how do you find owners that are interested in selling and try to connect them with, with buyers? Um, so real estate, as, as you likely know, is a relationship business. Um, and so, you know, you find owners or owners find you or opportunities come because you have established a reputation for yourself um, and you know somebody's got you know the reasons people sell are uh, death divorce partnership disillusions um, or it's just time to to exit the the investment uh, you've hit your return your, your return hurdles and you know your your mission in the company is to you know, generate for your investors a certain return and well, here it is. So let's, let's, let's sell. Our job as brokers is to go out there and be talking to the principals of uh, the ownership groups that own the assets in the markets that we track and to provide value to them so that when they decide, Hey, it's time to sell this asset for whatever reason, um, that we are the ones top of mind. Um, and it may be us in another group or, you know, we find ourselves competing just the same way that buyers compete for, uh, for deals as well. What are three, um, like what are three key things that you guys do to, to be uh, prospecting? Um, you know, you want to make sure that you're just, you're at, you're doing your best to add value on every call. And it, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, but, you know, if you're calling an easy call is, hey, I've got this listing. Is it something you're interested in? Even if you know it's not something they are, because at least it opens the door and it's not, hey, do you want to sell? Um, I've, I've done that. I'm guilty of that, certainly. But it's you really don't give a lot of traction with that. And you're really just, uh, that, that becomes a numbers game. If you're just, Hey, do you want to sell? Hey, do you want to sell? You've got to make like a hundred calls a day to find that one that, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll consider it. Um, so you want to be adding value. You want to be knowledgeable, uh, of the market of their properties. Um, and kind of, of of what's happening in the, in the capital markets, because essentially investment real estate is an offshoot of the greater capital markets. If you think about it, I mean, even a 20 unit could, is considered part of the capital markets, even if it's only 20 units, for instance. Sure. I think that was three. 
Um, let, let's shift a little bit because I think a lot of listeners will be interested in how do they build a relationship with a broker like you or really in any market when you're trying to get in. One of the hardest things to do is to find properties, especially right now. We're all, anybody who's buying is trying to find a property. They're trying to find something to buy and there's limited amount of properties that are going and they're all going for, for higher prices. So how do we build a relationship with a successful broker that is going to actually take us serious? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Cause I mean, we get calls uh, every day. Um, somebody wanting to get into the market and breakfast yesterday with an investor group. Um, you know, like I said, it's a relationship. Um, just as it's a relationship for us trying to build with the sellers, um, we're also wanting to build relationships with uh, buyers, uh, but we want credible buyers who we know we can rely on to do what they say um, and aren't going to make us look stupid, right? Because Sometimes you only get one shot at a deal, and if you select the wrong horse, well, you know, you may spend X amount of time on it, and it doesn't come to fruition, and everybody ends up frustrated because the buyer that you, you picked can't or won't uh, do what they said they would do. Um, so how do you build the relationship with a broker? Well, you know, as a good broker is going to spend the majority of their time on building uh, relationships with sellers. The reason that they're going to do that is because it doesn't, you can't make any money just trying to hustle off market deals and work with every buyer that comes to you because I feel like some of these, there are, there are some people out there, whether they do it intentionally or not, but it feels like they're professional time wasters. It's like, really? Like, how do you, how do you function? Um, and so it's, you know, making sure that if you step up to the plate, if you pick up the phone, the phone and make the call, make sure you're able to do what you, you say you can, or, or, you know, a quick no is better than a long maybe. Right. So, if, if you have your criteria, be upfront about that and say, you know, here's what I'm looking for. Uh, but then also be receptive to what we're telling you, because if your criteria are you want 11 caps on class A deals, I'll say, thanks so much. It's been great speaking with you. I wish you the best. Because those don't exist. It's like, and, and if they did, why would you be my first call? You know, that's sometimes a question and it maybe comes off a little um, blunt, uh, but it's like, well, why should I call you? Why should you be my first call? Because, you know, there are other groups who I know are credible. So what distinguishes you? Maybe that's something. Well, I think you make a really good point with the, when you talk about how you might only have one crack at a deal. So you've got a seller who, yeah, they're interested in selling, uh, but if you bring them the wrong buyer and that deal doesn't go through or they make you look, you know, look like an idiot, you're never going to get a chance with them again. You maybe, maybe can't, you don't even get to sell that deal potentially. And so you want to make sure that you're, you're bringing respectable buyers to, you know, to that deal and, and, buyers that can actually get the job done. So they have to prove mm -hmm. to you that they're, they're that type of buyer. Yeah, absolutely. How about, uh, you know, how about, uh, you know, consistency, if a buyer's consistently talking to you, does that help or is that more annoying <laughs> at times? Or do you get that buyer um, where it's like, okay, you back off a little bit, you just, you're kind of obnoxious. Maybe that's yeah, I've, I've had to have that conversation. Um, like, hey, listen, I, 
I, I think you're a great person, but you don't need to call me, you know, once a week. Uh, I'll call you when I have something. Yeah. Um, you know, because again, it, it's, uh, I'm out there front facing, trying to go out and find you the deals. And if you and I are on the phone for, you know, 45 minutes talking about whatever it is, it's like, that's not a very good use of 45 minutes. Yep. Um, so. Do you have any idea in, uh, just pick either Cincinnati, Columbus, whatever, how many, how many hundred plus unit multifamily deals are selling in a year about? Um, well, I know that Columbus has at least double the quantity of transactions that Cincinnati does. Mm -hmm. Part of that is due to, um, I think really our, our geography and our, our topography here in town. It's hillier here. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, harder true. to build larger complexes. Right. Um, so, but if you look at Columbus or Dayton or Indianapolis, uh, those are they tend to be flatter cities, so it's easier to build. Um, and you just, you know, plow out a field and there you go. Whereas here you have to do geotechnical surveys and engineering and pilings and all that sort of good stuff. So um, I probably should be able to quote you that figure, but I don't have that right off the top of my head. No, that's okay. It's not very many. It's, may it's maybe 10, maybe, maybe 15 in yeah. Cincinnati. So you're probably looking at 30 to 30 to 40 on the, on the very high end in Columbus or Indianapolis, I think had 70 transactions last year, maybe okay. the year before. Okay. Well, I guess my, the, the point of the question was that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about somebody calling you every week and, and a lot of books will tell you, hey, call, call these brokers, be on top of them, which is, you know, true to an extent. You also don't want to be annoying to them either. either. Um, but when you're talking, your main job is to work with the seller. So if somebody's continually just contacting you, and we only have, you know, 15, 20 properties that are selling in, in a year. It's not like you have a deal every day that you're trying to sell. Right. It's, it's a, a deal. Right you know, it's a deal a month type of thing uh, or maybe mm -hmm. a couple. So, but yeah, but at the same time, you do want to be, you do want to in the same, in the same way that we're trying to create top of mind status in our seller clients. Um, you know, it's, it's also good for a buyer to, um, you know, just check in either via phone or email um, and just say, Hey, just call in a check in. You know, what are you working on? Is there anything that we might be able to work on together? Yeah. Um, and it's like, yeah, you know, not right now. Um, I mean, you and I have had those conversations where it's like, well, this is what I have going and, you know, nothing really fits, but it's like, okay, nice talk to me. I'll talk to you in a, you know, a week or two weeks or next month. Yep. You know? Yep. Um, and there, there's those buyers too that are from, let's just to say California, because I think that's maybe one of the more common states um, that call you up and they expect to get a deal over the phone. Um, what, what would you say to them, those buyers? Um, is, is it, so, is it, are you going to take somebody serious over the phone or you got to meet them in person? So if they're bidding on a deal, especially a listing, uh, if they haven't seen it, we're not going to, we're not going to give it to them. Yeah. Um, and you know, they're like, well, we're not going to come in and see it until, uh, we have it tied up. And it's like, well, you know, there, there are five, 10 people behind you that have seen it, um, are at a competitive price and, you know, thanks for playing. We'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Like we, we just had a deal. We had a couple of deals that we marketed and we had 20 offers and wow. the highest offer um, was from a California group and they're high by far. Um, but, you know, our advice to the seller was they haven't seen it. Um, they don't own anything in the market. <sighs> I, 
I couldn't in good faith say, yeah, pick this buyer. Um, Cause I didn't have confidence that they'd be able to follow through with the transaction. Well, and, and that's right because they're putting a really high offer. So if it's that much higher than everybody else, you got to wonder, well, are they just trying to get the deal tied up and then they're going to retrade it? We're going to, they're going to. Yeah. It's like, you know, that a retrade is coming. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to do their research and go, Oh, I guess it's only worth this price. Uh, we'll, we'll buy it. For yeah. Them. Or it's like, if, if you're from California and you're coming in and you're bidding on a C class asset in the Midwest, um, that's what these were. You're going to get on site and you're going to be like, no. And, and, you know, it's going to take you a week, maybe two weeks to get out here. Um, it's just a waste of time. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think, I think if you're serious about, and we have a lunch today with an investor group, if you're serious about uh, making entry into a market that either it doesn't matter if you live in it or not, um, I think being out there and making the effort to um, say hello is um, very important. I mean, we do that uh, as brokers. We're on the road. I'm headed to Colorado in a couple of weeks to uh, do a proposal, and we're going to have some uh, have some meetings while we're out there because you know people like to do business with people that they know and and that they can trust and that they've met in person. So. You know, if they're not going to be uh, in your market, you got to go to them. Right, right. Well, good points. Uh, let's let's shift a little bit about uh, into the market and kind of what you're seeing, uh, how you're underwriting some of these deals. Because obviously, I think anybody knows that's has a pulse on the market that cap rates are compressed and prices are prices are high. So, how do you look at deals? you're trying to do your best representing the sellers, but you're also trying to be, you know, honest and represent the buyers as well to, you know, um, so talk to sure. us a bit about the market. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to ever have a, a, a client buy a property and then, you know, come back and say, well, you sold me this bill of goods. It's like, no, you know, we want, we want to make sure that you get a fair deal. And, you know, we're trying to work for that on every transaction. Uh, it doesn't always happen because sometimes the buyers don't take the advice that we've offered. Uh, <laughs> but to your question of, <laughs> um, to your question of how are we underwriting things and um, why are cap rates compressed? So when we're, cap rates are a relative measure. Um, and going back to the earlier comment of, of capital markets, and that's what we're functioning in you know, the value of the property that we're looking at is determined by the, we look at a couple of different metrics and the cap rate is really second or third. We're looking at the internal rate of return. We're looking at the cash on cash returns. Um, we look at uh, return on cost. Um, and so uh, we look at the three-year average, the seven-year average. Uh, we look at an unleveraged return, a leveraged return. Um, and so we have all these different, you know, we have all these different data points that we're taking into account when we're pricing a deal. Um, and sometimes I guess generally what we're shooting for, if it's stabilized and there's not a value add component, we're looking for generally like 8% cash on cash in year one. Um, and to get that on a on an amortized loan i think you're probably at like we're looking at we're looking for an eight to ten percent cash on cash return in in year one uh, and we're trying to be as real as possible on our income and our expenses um we we try not to be much more than five you know ten percent if we really have to stretch it if there's a good reason uh above their the seller's income um and then on expenses oftentimes in our pro forma and i think todd you could probably attest to this is we're above uh the seller's expenses in our pro forma so we you know we try and be real about um how it's going to operate 
Um, and so that all trickles down. Then we have the, um, so you have the NOI before uh, reserves, and then you have the NOI after reserves. That's the number that we're keying on for our cash on cash returns. Uh, and then we factor appropriate, you know, again, if it's stabilized, we're looking for at least a 1.25 debt coverage ratio. Um, and, you know, when we're pricing a deal, we're going to try and max it out, right? Like we're going to go to the seller and say, well, here's our range. Um, you know, we've taken into account uh, maybe you've got uh, a, a higher loss to lease because you prefer to just keep it full than maximize the rent. So we've kind of, uh, we've compressed that loss to lease, but we've also increased your vacancy factor a little bit. Maybe we've identified that you're um, not implementing or you don't have a utility reimbursement program and we're theorizing that you could phase that in over three years. Um, so that's why we're, you know, 6% above your income. Um, and then, you know, we'll look at, there's a lot of, especially on smaller deals, there's miscategorization or, or mis uh, placement of expenses and category like you know, you'll see like uh, repairs and maintenance numbers that are well they include the, the maintenance and salary in there it's like okay well that should be in salaries and payroll we'll just recategorize it and try and make that all line up appropriately how do you how do you break it to the seller when they're and, and how do they take it when they're you know think they're running a property efficiently and uh, but you go, well, geez, you know, you're self-managing this thing. You're doing this, some of these repairs on your own or whatever. Uh, this is really where it should be at. What do sellers think when you do that? Because I'm sure that happens, especially on the smaller properties when you're talking like a 50 or under unit. Yeah. Um, you know, you try, you say, well, we had we had this instance a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where we had this this group and they were self managing, um, and they're looking around the country and they're like, you know, we see assets that are similar to this that are selling for forty to fifty a door. So that's what we think our properties are worth. So I went through them. I I walked all three of them, um, and then we did our financial analysis and it's like, guys, these aren't, they're not worth on the level that you think that they are. And, and here's where we think they're worth. And, you know, here's how we came to those conclusions. Um, and so it's, you know, it's not like you're an idiot, you're doing a terrible job, but you know, this is <laughs> what yeah, our yeah. income and expense looks like. And, yeah. um, you know, if you want to hit those numbers, and, and we did that, we said, if you want to hit those numbers, this is what your rents have to be at. And it was like two to $300 above where um, they currently were. And it's like, you're not actually going to hit those numbers in those neighborhoods, but thanks for playing. We'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like that. Cause, and I would say that's reflective of, you know, what, what you bring uh, that I see is that, you know, I mean, sometimes we can disagree a little bit on numbers or I might be, you know, underwriting a little <laughs> differently, but your numbers come when we, when we look at brokers in general, your numbers are yeah. fairly accurate. Um, and right. You guys do, you guys do a good job at trying to portray what, where the market's at. And I would, yeah, I can see that you're just not taking listings just to take a listing because I do see some bro yeah. that it just feels like did you just take this listing? Did you just you just didn't want to say no or or what? Because some of these numbers are just pie in the sky. I just can't get them. Uh, but for most, right. of you guys are you know your underwriting's good uh, and it looks like you guys talk to your sellers about realistic terms. So that's mm -hmm. that's nice. Um, what, uh, where, where do you see this market going right now? And, you know, where is there, are you seeing weakening in the market or is it, you know, kind of, kind of where are we at? That's the, 
billion dollar question really <laughs> um and for you know years there's been talk or questions of, of you know where we're at in the market and you know right now we're 10 years into the we're at the 10 year mark of of the 2008 downturn um but you know and and i hear people saying that oh this is reminiscent of then um and that was just when i had started my my career so i can't really speak to now versus then but um you know i think that the fed is you know they are slowly raising interest rates but i don't think i think also so i don't think that that's going to have a, a tremendous in, negative impact on prices um and values uh, because i think we're going to see a lot more value add um and real value add stories coming out because of the recent change in the tax law where you're able to capitalize uh, all of your improvements in the year that they were done uh as i believe as i yeah. believe it's yep. written um instead of over their lifetime so i think that the purpose of that is to you know somebody made the analogy one time that we have all these old um you know buicks and chevys in the market those are those properties built in the you know 60s 70s maybe even into the 80s now you know the 80s products are 30 almost 40 years old um So I think that the result of that is going to have a lot more capital influx into these existing assets that probably have needed it. You know, they've, they've been held together with um, <laughs> duct tape and bubble gum for, for a long time. And, you know, they need new HVAC units. They need, uh, you know, new roofs, uh, new windows. Um, boilers or chillers maybe elevators if they're mid or high rise um so so what's going to happen with prices that was your original question yeah i don't think that they're i think you know rents have and we were talking about this a little bit earlier rents have been going up kind of at a record pace but you know we're, we over the past few years we've been seeing a, a three to five in some instances uh, percent increase in rents. And I think that they will likely continue at a 3% rate. So if you factor on an increase of 3% on your um, rents and, and two and a half on your expenses, well, you know, you're going to continue to see an upward uh, trend in, in your prices. Because there's so much capital out there. I mean, like I said, we had 20, 20 offers on some C-class assets here in town. And it's, I was astounded. I was amazed. Yeah, well, uh, I guess I should stop talking about Cincinnati. To be, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, so, I mean, that's the trend. We had, yeah. we had a deal in Columbus with the same, nearly the same amount. Yeah. So, well, and and the deal that I was talking to you about uh, prior to you know hitting the record button, I think that had right around thirty offers on it, and so it just that's amazing. Yeah, it's just crazy. Um, let's let's a couple last things, and then we'll wrap up, uh, or one last thing, uh, and then we'll wrap up. What are three key factors to your success? And, and your brokerage's success? Um, I'll start with Capstone Apartment Partners because they've, um, the leadership of our firm has made a very conscious effort to not just take every listing, but to get out there and do our best to build relationships. Um, and it's paid off. I got a call last night from a, um, an institutional owner and 
he's like, you know, usually I don't, I don't return these types of calls because I didn't, I hadn't met with him, but he's like, I have a great relationship with your Carolinas team. I know you wouldn't be wasting my time. And so, you know, here's a, here's an opportunity for you. Um, and that was, I was like, yeah, this is, this is the right place, the, the right place to be. So the first thing I think is, um, being conscious of, I guess your reputation and how you're being perceived out there in the market. Cause even if you don't care, um, uh, what other people think of you, um, others do and they will act accordingly. Um, and then, uh, so the second thing is I just work really hard and, and try and work as smart as possible. And, you know, you want to surround yourself with great people as well. We've got a great uh, marketing team who does a great job. Our um, analyst staff uh, are tremendous. And my co-brokers that I work with uh, daily um, are also really good. And, you know, we all have something that we can uh, learn from each other every day. So, um Number three, I don't know, I kind of wrapped them all in together, but maybe the third is just, you know, know your, know your market that you're, you know, if you're looking at it from an investor point of view, you want to know every deal that's out there, uh, whether you're going to be able to acquire it or not for whatever reason, maybe it's too big for you. Maybe it's too small. I mean, if it's too small, then you don't necessarily need to know it, but you probably need to be conscious of it. And then, you know, have a, make sure you have a firm grasp on, on, uh, financial markets and how, uh, the, the different lending products that are available may or may not, uh, shape what you're trying to do. Cool. What's your favorite book? <sighs> um, the first one that came to mind is Think and Grow Rich, which I haven't I haven't read or, or listened to in a while, but um, I do love that one. It's a good one. Awesome. So, Stash, I appreciate appreciate you being on the show and taking time. How do our listeners get in touch with you if they want to uh, find out more? Great question. Um, our website is capstoneapts.com. My email address is stash, S-T-A-S-H, at capstone, A-P-T-S, dot com. And my cell phone number is 513-417-5588. Awesome. Again, I appreciate you being on the show, taking time out of your day to talk to us. And uh, you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks, Todd. You too. Awesome. I appreciate the opportunity. Hey, I appreciate uh, Stash joining us on the show and taking time out of his day. It's always fun to hear from a uh, successful real estate broker on, you know, how do you really communicate with brokers? Because I think a lot of us struggle, especially in a market that's hot like it is right now. Deals are hard to find. Uh, good deals, I should say, are hard to find. You can find deals. Uh, anybody will sell you their property, but do the numbers truly work? And so building a, a relationship with brokers are, are really important and understanding how to do that is also important. And I struggle um, just like everyone else um, sometimes with, with doing it the exact right way or in there really is no exact right way, but um, we want to do a few things and a few things I took from, from stash is uh, establish your reputation, you know, make sure you add value to that broker, try to do what you can to add value to them. Uh, and then also try to have knowledge of the market and the properties and the capital markets and all that kind of stuff. So make sure you understand what you're doing when you do establish a relationship. You don't want to just be uh, the person that's always asking the questions and always taking, you want to be, able to provide some value and the more you can do that, the better. Um, and also with building relationships, you know, be, be consistent, uh, you know, 
be be conscious about your reputation you talked about uh, and then also you know let's say they send you a deal they want to hear a no from you versus a maybe uh, and he said uh, a quick no is better than a a slow you know no or just a maybe and then maybe never hearing from you again so uh make sure you're you're you know being conscious about how you're how you're acting around that broker um the other thing that i thought was valuable uh that he said is you know surround yourself with with great people and that's how he's built uh, a good brokerage and a good reputation uh, he has his partners with capstone he has capstone themselves and surrounded himself with great people uh, and the last thing is know your market um, and this talks to brokers and of course investors as well as know your market uh, and really anybody that's in business know uh, your market and understand it um, and then understand the markets that affect it as well. So again, I appreciate Stash for joining us, taking time out of his day, uh, tons of value that uh, he was able to give us. So, uh, reach out to him, Stash at Campstone uh, Apartments.com, uh, Capstone APTS.com. So S T A S H, and we'll put that in the show notes as well. Uh, if you enjoy this podcast, if you enjoy uh, listening, you know, share it out with your friends, network, uh, you know, put it on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever uh, you can do and share it out. Let other people know you're listening and then give us a rating review on iTunes. And we also want to hear your feedback. So uh, become connected with us on Facebook at our Pillars of Wealth Facebook page and, and just make comments. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you want to hear about. Uh, we want to make sure we're serving you as best we can. So uh, let us know what we can do to improve uh, on Facebook and, and we'll, we'll do our best. So uh, appreciate everybody listening uh, to the show and make every day Saturday. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income and start building equity in properties. Their simple intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today.